Hello and welcome to the presentation. I'm Mike Ling and today I'm going to be talking to you about loss of safe separation. But first, a little bit about me. I fly as Blade 3 in the Blades aerobatic team based at Cywell. Prior to this, I spent 21 years as a pilot in the Royal Air Force. And during this time, I spent 10 years flying with the Red Arrows. I'm a board member of the European Airshow Council. I'm also a board member of the Royal Aeronautical Society's Learning Society Board. And I'm a patron of Fly to Help and the Nick Davidson Memorial Flying Scholarship Trust. I've been flying for over 24 years, having first learned to fly a Cessna at Manston in 1997, and I've been an avid GA pilot ever since. Whilst my role with the Blades is mainly as a display pilot flying the Extra 300, I also fly the PA-31 Navajo for 2XL Aviation, the Spitfire for Ultimate Warbird Flights, and anything else I can get my hands on. The presentation today is brought to you by Astral Aviation Consulting, who are working in partnership with the CAA to provide a general aviation safety campaign throughout 2021. Keep an eye out for their upcoming panel events and other materials on their website, www.astralaviationconsulting.com. You can also follow them on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter to keep up to date with the latest in GA safety. The campaign itself has two core safety objectives. First, to raise flight safety awareness within the GA community in order to reduce the risk of preventable aviation incidents. Second, to promote a just culture through open and transparent communications in order to increase reporting and encourage meaningful discussions within the community. Raising awareness of key risks and promoting a just culture where people report and talk openly about their mistakes will benefit the whole community and make it safer for all. Moving on to the scope, here's what we're going to talk about today. First, we'll cover today's aim. Second, what is loss of safe separation? Why do you need to know about it? And most importantly, what can you do about it? We'll then move on to look at a recent case study. We'll then discuss the three enduring principles which you'll see running throughout this safety campaign. Prepare, plan, perform. We'll then look a bit into some human factors elements that can impact a loss of safe separation scenario. We'll then look at our four main takeaways and have a discussion on reporting. Finally, some useful resources have been included at the end, and you will also be able to access these through the Astral Aviation Consulting website, as detailed in the previous slides. The presentation will remain on the Astral Aviation website, and you can skip to any section you wish by using the slider below in case you want to pause, rewind, or come back later. So please grab a cup of tea and let's discuss loss of safe separation. So what's today's aim? Well, the aim of this presentation is for you to consider your personal preparation and planning and how that affects your performance to help you avoid a loss of safe separation situation. In doing so, this will help you become better equipped to deal with unexpected situations that might arise whilst airborne and again, help you avoid a loss of safe separation event. Sound preparation and comprehensive planning should lead to a good, safe airborne performance. Do you always prepare well for every flight? Do you always thoroughly plan what you're going to do? Is your performance always the best it can be? Do you reflect on your flight afterwards and consider what you'll be doing better next time? We will explore each of these over the course of this presentation. So what is loss of safe separation? It's the unplanned or unintended reduction in separation between two aircraft or air systems. Or to put it another way, I got closer to that aircraft than I intended to. Or even, I did not know that I came close to another aircraft and I only found out about it afterwards. But why do we need to know about it? Because this won't happen to you, will it? Sadly, in the worst case scenario, a loss of safe separation could lead to a mid-air collision with catastrophic results. The UK Airprox board quote that for every 60 Airproxes, there is one mid-air collision. The Skyway code states that almost all mid-air collisions occur in good VMC at relatively low levels. Therefore, it could happen to anyone, couldn't it? To give you an idea of the amount of loss of safe separation events that occur in the UK, the 2019 UK Airprox board results were reviewed as these are the most recent and representative set of figures. That report showed that there were a total of 328 Airproxes in 2019, of which 203 were manned aircraft to aircraft encounters. Of those 203, a total of 146 were risk bearing, with 68 being risk bearing manned aircraft to aircraft Airproxes. So what does this mean to us? Well, it means that on average, there was a risk of collision about two to three times a week in 2019. 
The statistics also show that on average, there was a risk of collision between two manned aircraft slightly more often than once a week for that year. That's a two aircraft collision or loss of safe separation incident once every nine days. Looking at the trends between different sectors, it can be seen that the 10 year increasing trend is exclusively within the GA sector. What this means is that as a GA pilot, you are 66% more likely to have a loss of safe separation incident now than you were in 2010. And also you're more likely to have that incident or airprox in a GA aircraft than you are in any other aircraft group. This is obviously not a good situation and one we all need to try and address. But what can we do about it? Quoting from the Airprox board report, it said, GA to GA incidents continue to rise and continue to represent the sector where the most difference can be made with a targeted educational approach. We'll now look at a recent case study, a loss of safe separation that led to the worst case scenario, a fatal mid-air collision involving two GA aircraft, a Cessna 152 and a Gimbal Cabri G2 helicopter. Here are both of the accident aircraft. The bottom left picture is a photograph of the in-flight conditions taken by a pilot of another aircraft operating in the area 10 minutes before the accident and traveling in the same direction. Both aircraft were serviceable, were captained by experienced pilots and the weather was nice. It was a lovely day to go flying. So what happened? Well, both aircraft were on their second instructional flight of the day. They both took off from Wickham Air Park and flew to an operating area which was in Class G airspace, but below the 1500 foot altitude restriction for the provision of traffic service by the nearest air traffic services unit. The Cabri G2 was flying at 1500 feet on a Navex, and the Cessna 152 was conducting a glide descent exercise that started at 4000 feet. The Cessna descended onto the helicopter from behind and resulted in a fatal mid-air collision. Both aircraft had electronic conspicuity device fitted. The Cessna had mode S, and the helicopter had mode S and ADSB, but neither was equipped with a device that could receive and display ADSB information to its pilots. The AAIB report drew a number of conclusions. They concluded that the opportunity for the occupants of either aircraft to see the other was limited because although they were in close proximity for some time, they were both following a similar track and were not in each other's field of view. The forward view from the Cessna is restricted due to the forward mounted engine, and it would have been impractical for the pilots of the helicopter to search the area behind and above them. As neither aircraft was electronically conspicuous to the other, the only available method of collision avoidance between the two aircraft was see and avoid. As the separation between the two aircraft gradually reduced over several minutes, the use of compatible electronic conspicuity devices could have improved situational awareness such that avoiding action could have been taken. It was not possible to determine from radar data whether or not the Cessna conducted any lookout weaves before or during its descent. So what can you do to avoid this happening to you? The first thing you can do is fit compatible electronic conspicuity devices. ADS-B is universal and is the CAA's preferred technology standard for achieving airborne SA for pilots and air traffic controllers. Interoperability is the overriding factor in the selection of any system. The next thing you can do is try to operate in areas where you can get an air traffic service and once airborne, make sure you ask for one. You can also ensure that you conduct an effective lookout scan and weave in any descent to clear any blind spots, for example, under the nose. Finally, both aircraft took off from the same airfield and went to the same airspace. Is there a deconfliction plan within your own flying club or airfield that shows where people are intending to operate? Having now looked at the growing loss of safe separation airbox trends and a specific case study, let's analyze the causal factors of airproxes. The UK Airprox Board reports on a number of safety barriers that if effective should prevent a loss of safe separation. However, the five least effective barriers in 2019 were ATC situational awareness and action, pilot situational awareness and action, pilot tactical planning and execution, electronic warning system operation and compliance, and finally, see and avoid. Let's take each of these in turn and highlight the main contributory factors that lead to the failure of that barrier and highlight the areas that you can work on to prevent a loss of safe separation incident. ATC SA in action was only fully effective 24% of the time. 
However, this was often as a result of the actions of the flight elements. For example, if the aircraft in question was not fitted with the transponder and the pilot was not in communication with an ATS, it was highly unlikely that ATS would have had SA on that particular aircraft. Further, the breakdown in SA was almost exclusively as a result of pilots either not requesting an air traffic service, requesting a suboptimal service for their sortie profile or weather conditions, or an incorrect understanding of what the selected air traffic service will give them. Pilot SA in action was either ineffective or only partially effective in 80% of incidents. In harmony with the ATC situation awareness and action barrier, the reduction in effectiveness is overwhelmingly as a result of pilot suboptimal or no communication with an air traffic service unit or lack of an electronic means to gain SA. This is not to say that pilots should be communicating at all points. Indeed, pilots are under no remit to talk to with anybody under most conditions. However, communicating your presence and intentions is an easy way of enhancing everybody's SA. So listen out, make the correct calls at the correct times, use the correct phraseology and clearly articulate your intentions. Other contributory factors that reduce the effectiveness of this barrier are as a result of distraction and a lack of spare capacity in the cockpit. These can generally be addressed through thorough planning, thinking through contingencies and being prepared for the unexpected. Moving on to pilot tactical planning and execution of the plan was fully effective in only 40% of incidents, but only partially so in 38%, often due to pilots not modifying their flight plan in flight to account for changing circumstances. The planning element mitigates inexperience and low hours and enhances the essay of any pilot regardless of experience. The plan adaptation element is highly reliant on the planning element and also highlights the need to think through not just what to do, but how to do it. The more that can be done on the ground, where all the information required is easily accessible and where your capacity is at its greatest, then the better the chances of executing a safe and uneventful flight. The fourth barrier to loss of safe separation is electronic warning system operation and compliance. Onboard collision warning or avoidance equipment was absent, not used or ineffective, mostly due to incompatibilities between equipment in 69% of incidents. The main reasons being that one or both aircraft did not have any equipment fitted or where fitted, they were incompatible. When compatible equipment was fitted, the barrier was strong and allowed either ATC or pilot action to occur, which prevented a more serious situation developing. Compatible electronic security is one of the easiest methods of enhancing SA and indeed may well have prevented the fatal accident I spoke about earlier. The final barrier is see and avoid which was only fully effective as a barrier in 42% of incidents. In many circumstances, sea and avoid is the last barrier to air procs or mid-air collision. However, it is one of the weakest due primarily to the physiological limitations of the human eye and the fallibility of the human brain. There are well-known mitigations to compensate for our weaknesses in unusual environments, such as a robust, robust lookout, methodical scanning techniques, and an awareness that stationary objects are on a collision course. Distraction also plays an important part. And while the advent of electronic conspicuity may well enhance overall SA, having additional displays in the cockpit can lead to a reduced lookout and increased distraction. Therefore, your cockpit work cycle should prioritise this accordingly. In summary, the greatest areas for improvement in preventing loss of safe separation or an air procs are lack of or incompatible electronic conspicuity, poor planning, low situational awareness, and see and avoid, which includes an ineffective lookout scan. We've picked up on lookout quite a bit in the last few slides, so let's take some time to discuss what an effective lookout scan is. The UK Airprox board recommend looking 80% outside and 20% inside the cockpit. It may sound obvious, but it's easy to get distracted checking maps, instruments and displays, and before you know it, it's been a while since you looked outside. An effective scan gets around the limitations of the human eye by breaking up the lookout area into sectors. You can't scan the entire area outside the cockpit in one go, so break it up. For example, when looking out, divide up the view out of the cockpit into left, center, and right, then use a scan and focus technique. Scan across the center section, resting and focusing on something specific, such as a cloud for one second to give your eyes time to stabilize, then move to the left section, repeat the scan and focus, move back to the center section and to the right. Once complete, look inside the cockpit to check your attitude and instruments before repeating the lookout scan. Try to develop and practice an airborne work cycle that incorporates both flying the aircraft and looking out. For example, lookout, attitude, instruments. If you have an electronic conspicuity device fitted, you could expand this to include, for example, lookout, 
attitude instruments traffic. Having looked at what loss of safe separation is and some of the underpinning evidence and analysis, we'll now focus on how your preparation and planning can enhance your overall performance and help you avoid any loss of safe separation situations. Mental preparation. Think about this as something you do well before going flying. For example, before you leave the house or the office. Have I thought about my flight? It may sound obvious, but thinking about the activity well before even getting close to starting it may trigger something you may have missed. For example, if you were going for a round of golf or for a bike ride in the rain, you would likely think about what attire you would be wearing well before picking up your clubs or getting the bike out of the garage. Have I allowed enough time to prepare for my flight and think things through? Things will cover a lot of topics and will be different for each of you depending on what it is you're planning to do, but time is the key principle here. By not allowing any or sufficient time, you'll already be on the back foot. If you were going on a long or unfamiliar car journey, you'd naturally allow enough time to think about the route you would take. Is there anything new or more difficult I might encounter today? Using the car journey analogy here, it highlights the point to think about a situation that you may not have countered or not done for a while. For example, are you planning to land somewhere new or unfamiliar? Is there anything distracting me today? We constantly get distractions or get distracted easily in our day-to-day -day lives. Recognizing and acknowledging distractions allows you to challenge and deal with them and to not take them with you when you go flying. Is the weather suitable for my plan and experience level? Do I need to go flying today if the weather is marginal? Can it wait for another day? Is the aircraft that I'm flying today airworthy? Are cockpit transparencies clean? Is the software on my equipment up to date? Have I thought about last time something did not go expected and that I'd do differently this time? Was there a recent flight where I did not look out as much as I could or should have? Did I follow the correct procedures? Can I learn from any of my own experiences to improve my performance on my next flight? You may be content that you are mentally prepared to go flying, but what is equally as important is your own physical state. Even if you are slightly under the weather, you won't be able to perform to the best of your ability. If you're not on your A game, you may well erode your ability to fly the aircraft accurately, conduct an effective lookout scan, or utilize an effective work cycle. A number of organizations have adopted the IMSAFE, I'm Safe Checklist, which is a very useful and handy tool to run through. You can find this in the useful resources section on this website. Finally, ask yourself the question, am I mentally and physically prepared to fly? Should I be flying today? Now let's imagine that you have now arrived at the flying club or airfield and you're focusing on the flight itself. Some of these questions you may have already addressed or answered, but using the quote, measure twice but cut once, can only help to confirm that you've prepared and planned as best and as thoroughly as possible. Have I allowed enough time to plan my flight and think it through? Where am I flying today? What am I planning to do? Am I flying circuits today or am I doing a cross-country navix? What the flight involves will determine the amount of planning required and therefore the time required to plan. Try not to put yourself under time pressure. Rushing the plan may well end up in mistakes that are carried airborne. Is my equipment and software up to date? Make a final check of your equipment prior to climbing into the aircraft. Also, think about the settings you will use. For example, are the NOTEM overlays switched on? Do I understand the weather? Has it changed since I left the house? Is it suitable for what I'm going to do? If not, can I conduct my flight where the weather might be better? If I'm flying in worse weather conditions than I've experienced before, am I going to be looking out of the cockpit enough or focusing too much on displays or charts inside the cockpit? What happens when I get airborne and the weather has changed? What do I do? Where do I go? Can I achieve the flight if the weather turns bad or do I need to come back to the airfield? Will the weather at the airfield still be suitable when I return? What is my diversion? How do I get there? Have I looked at airspace? Think about it both horizontal and vertically. Am I operating from a location I'm unfamiliar with today? If so, what are the airspace differences to my local area? Are there areas of expected increased activity, such as choke points, VRPs, or nav beacons that I might need to consider and may increase my workload at certain points in the flight and may reduce my lookout and SA? Have I thought about air traffic services? Who do I need to call when I'm airborne? Do I have the correct ATC frames with me? Should I rehearse any difficult radio calls? What service do I need? What do I need to tell? Do I need to submit a canopy? Have I considered contingencies? This is the most important aspects of the planning phase. Most plans require modification once airborne and thinking through the what ifs prior to getting airborne will greatly enhance your overall essay and improve your performance. So make time to think about things such as weather, 
contingencies, aircraft issues, delayed takeoff, equipment failures. Why not do a final I'm safe checklist at the end of the plan to confirm you are ready to fly? Finally, once you have planned your flight and before you head out to the aircraft, ask yourself the question, have I planned adequately for my flight? Should I be flying today? Sound preparation and comprehensive planning should lead to a good, safe airborne performance. However, preparation and planning alone don't make for a safe flight, so we need to consider performance or what can I do about it today. Having prepared and planned well, it may be a good idea to rehearse some elements of your planned flight with the focus of today's theme, loss of safe separation in mind. This can also be known as armchair flying, where you sit and think through the flight in order from takeoff to landing and also give yourself challenges such as, what if I have an engine failure here? Where am I going to go? Or what if I see traffic in my 11 o'clock approaching this choke point? What do I do? The limitations of see, be seen and avoid are well known and have been discussed earlier in this presentation. But if you think about it before going flying, it may help to remind you when you're airborne and when things are getting busy or not as expected. A lack of prioritization is a causal factor for many air proxies. So think about when you need to prioritize and when. If in doubt, aviate, navigate and communicate in that order. So you've been flying and you had a safe flight, well done. But of course, you didn't have a perfect flight where everything went exactly according to plan, did you? So what can you do to improve for next time? Well, generally speaking, we're all in a rush throughout our daily lives and we rarely afford ourselves the time to reflect on everything we do. However, one of the best ways of learning from your own mistakes is to reflect on your flight as soon as you can after landing, whilst it's fresh in your mind. Think about what went well? What could I have done better? Was I sufficiently prepared? What didn't go well or as expected? Was my airborne work cycle effective? Did I identify any issues or lessons that could be shared? Did I make any mistakes that others can learn from? Should I tell someone? Should I submit a mandatory occurrence report or voluntary occurrence report or a confidential report? Remember that whilst it can be easy to focus on what can be improved for next time, it's important to focus on what aspects of your flight went well. So you can also build on those for the future. It's important to consider human factors in everything we do, particularly when it comes to flying, as they can have such a big impact on our performance. Anything that has a human involved, is such as driving, running, cycling, operating machinery, and of course flying, is affected by human factors. So how do human factors influence loss of safe separation? The see, be seen and avoid principle is heavily influenced by human factors due to the limitations of our eyes to see other aircraft and of our brains to process and prioritize information. Who has looked out, looked away, only to discover there was an aircraft where you just looked? Who's ever missed a radio call when they've been busy doing other things in the cockpit? I know I have, and this shows us the limitations of being human whilst flying aircraft. This can be compounded by the physical airborne environment, such as the cockpit and the weather, which contribute to weakening any strategies we may have in place to counter our human factors failings, such as our airborne work cycle. Everyone makes errors and mistakes in everything they do because we're all human. If we can be proud of each flight knowing we did our best, but also be responsible and report any errors we make, we can help others to learn from them, however insignificant they may seem. When I first started flying, I would have loved to have had a cheat sheet of all the errors pilots have made so I could avoid them instead of making most of them myself because I didn't know about them. This brings me nicely on to reporting. Reporting increases awareness for all GA operators. Identifying hazards and near misses, however insignificant they may seem to you, is predictive reporting and will help to avoid a more serious incident or accident. But what can you do about it? Report, report, report. Report any and all incidents in a timely manner and include as much detail as you can on the report as reporting may prevent recurrences. What report should you submit? A mandatory occurrence report, a voluntary occurrence report, a confidential report, or an airprox. Links can be found on this website under resources. However, if in doubt, submit a report in any format as more reporting equals more safety awareness and ultimately your report may save someone's life. Well, thank you for listening to this loss of safe separation presentation. I hope you found it informative and thought provoking. But before I go, I'd like to leave you with some key takeaways. Loss of safe separation is the unplanned or unintended reduction in separation between two aircraft or air systems, or I came closer to that aircraft than I intended, or I did not know I came closer to another aircraft and only found out about it afterwards. 
You need to know about it because it affects you. Remember, for every 60 air proxies, there's likely to be one mid-air collision. You're now more likely to have a loss of safe separation incident or air proxy in a GA aircraft than you are in any other aircraft. You can reduce your chances of having a loss of safe separation air proxy incident by ensuring you adequately prepare for your flight, undertake comprehensive planning and utilize an effective airborne work cycle, which should lead to a good, safe airborne performance. Finally, when you reflect on your performance, please report incidents and near misses, however insignificant they may seem, as you may save someone's life. If you want to do more research into this topic, we can certainly point you in the direction of further resources. The reports and guidance below provide a wealth of information on loss of safe separation, along with reporting guidance on how to report errors, mistakes, incidents and accidents. These links are all available on the Astral Aviation website under resources. Let's continue the conversation. Astral Aviation would love to hear more about what you think on this topic and indeed any other GA safety topic. Please get in touch through their contact us form on their website or by emailing contact.astralaviation at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow them on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook to keep up to date with the latest news and information. Well, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you today and hopefully you've taken away some considerations for your next flight.